What's up YouTube? In this video, I'll be showing you how to deploy a Node.js web API to Heroku. This video assumes you have some base Node.js knowledge. If you're not familiar with Node.js, that is totally fine, but I won't be going over how to build the Node.js app itself in this video. This video is specifically going to be focused on deploying the app to Heroku and also setting up continuous deployment so that the app is automatically deployed each time a new commit is added to the main branch, whether via pull request or direct push. This video will be pretty fast paced, which will save you time if you're just looking for a quick overview of the process, but I recommend pausing or slowing down the video if you're trying to follow along step by step. Editor Jay here. As I was editing the video, I saw an article posted by Heroku a few days ago mentioning that they are planning to stop offering their free tier on November 28th, 2022. If you're watching this video before November 28th, now is the time to try Heroku for free while you still have that option. If you're watching the video after November 28th, the instructional portion of this video should still be accurate, but you will have to choose a paid tier. Let's hop into the video. We'll be using Heroku's free tier, which includes the following features. It is free with no expiry as of this time. With AWS and Google Cloud, the free trials are generally limited to one to three months with a certain amount of free credits. It has an automatically configured SSL enabled subdomain, or you can add a custom domain. This is something that I really like because I'm not a network guy and sometimes configuring a domain can be surprisingly difficult. It auto restarts if the process dies and it can be deployed pretty easily using GitHub Actions, which is one thing that we'll be looking at in this video. The downsides of using the free tier include a limited number of dyno hours per month. Dyno is the terminology that Heroku uses for containers. The dyno will sleep after it hasn't been active for 30 minutes, and then the next request will wake up the dyno automatically, but the first request will take 10 to 20 seconds, depending on your server. After that request will have normal latency. Uh, and some features such as running multiple dynos for a single app for redundancy are not included with the free tier. For those reasons, the free tier is best suited for a small hobby or example project uh, and not necessarily something that you would want actual users to use. That said, there is an easy paid upgrade path if you need those extra features in the future. Now that you have an idea of some of the pros and cons of Heroku, let me show you the app that we'll be deploying. I'll have a link to the repo in the video description. As you can see, it's a pretty simple node project. It's just an express web API with some in-memory storage to mock a database. Everything is in one file for simplicity. Again, don't take this node app as best practice. It's just a simple app for demo purposes. The focus is on the deployment in this video. Up at the top, we're reading in some environment variables. We're reading in the port environment variable. This will be set by Heroku. It's important to make sure that the app is running on the port specified by Heroku Otherwise, the app won't be listing on the port that Heroku is sending a request to. And then we'll default the port to port 3000 when port is not set, for example, when running locally. And it is important to call it uppercase port. We're grabbing node EMV, which Heroku will set to production. This could be used if we had separate databases for our app to connect to in the development, staging, or production environments. And finally, we have a my setting variable just to show that you can set custom environment variables. They don't need to be something that's built into Node or Heroku. And these environment variables will be shown at our health check API, which we will look at a little bit later. Here you can see we're setting up an express app. And down here you can see we're using an in-memory database. It's just an array of music albums, starting with one album, which will be set each time the app is started. Note that we definitely wouldn't want to do this for an actual app since the memory will be cleared and reset each time the app restarts. We would want to use something like a MongoDB or Postgres database in order to make our service RESTful. Then we have our standard REST endpoints. We have a get all albums, get album by ID, insert album, and delete album by ID. We don't have an update endpoint and there's no specific reason for that. I just didn't implement it. Then down here near the bottom, we have two utility endpoints, our health check endpoint, which shows the current status of our service, as well as the node EMV that it's running in and the my setting custom environment variable. Remember, we read these from the system environment variables at the top of the file. We also have an endpoint to stop the service. Obviously, you wouldn't want to have this in an actual app, but I have added it to show you that Heroku restarts the app when it is stopped. And in this video, we'll mostly look at the health check endpoint for demonstration purposes. Then at the very bottom, we start up the express server listening on the port that Heroku specified in the port environment variable. Now, if we start up the app, we can pass in a custom value for my setting and we'll see this at our health check endpoint. The npm run start dev is set up to use nodemon to restart the server locally each time we save a file. The npm start command is set up to run the app using node. 
By default, the npm start command is the command that Heroku will run to start the app when it detects a Node.js project. Now if we make a call to the health check endpoint, we see that we get a response. We set the my setting environment variable to test, and we see that here. Since we didn't specify the node EMV, it is not set, but we will see it when the app is running in Heroku. If we make a request to the albums endpoint, we can view the album that is set when the app starts. Everyone loves Nickelback. We can also insert an album and view the updated list. Pretty straightforward. I've already pushed this code up to a GitHub repository where we'll be deploying the app from. The repository is called node-heroku, linked down in the video description in case you want to fork the repo in order to deploy it yourself. Now we'll go to heroku.com and create an account. Then once you've entered your information, Heroku will send you a verification email. Go to the email and click on the verification link, which will take you to the page to set your password. Once you've entered your password, you can come back to Heroku and log in. When you log in, you'll be prompted to set up multi-factor authentication, which I recommend using because it makes it much more difficult for someone to get into your account. Then you'll be asked to review and accept the terms of service. Now that we're logged into Heroku, we can create our new app. The name of the app is unique across Heroku, not just our account. And then we will select the reason that we would like to use and click create app. There are a few ways to deploy your app on Heroku. Starting from right to left, you could install the Heroku CLI and deploy a container to Heroku that way. I have not used this method and we won't be going over that in this video. I assume this would be used to deploy something like a Docker container. The middle option, connecting with GitHub, is probably the easiest to set up. So for a simple app, it's a good method to use, but it does lack some configuration options. We'll go over this method first. And then the option on the left is to use the Heroku CLI to deploy your app. I haven't used the Heroku CLI directly, but the open source GitHub action we will use to deploy our app does use the Heroku CLI behind the scenes. This is a little more complex to set up, but is much more configurable. It also follows more of an infrastructure as code pattern, which can help make the process more repeatable and consistent long-term. We will go over this method second. First, I will show you how to deploy to Heroku by connecting to a GitHub account. I will click this middle option, then click connect to GitHub. It will probably open up a new browser window and ask you to log in with GitHub. I think it's automatically doing that for me in this screen recording since I'm already logged into the GitHub in this browser, or maybe it's because it's a public repo. Now we can select the repository we want to link. The repo that we want to link is called Node Heroku, so we'll type it out, click search, and then click connect next to the repo. Then we are taken to the deployment page. At the bottom, you see the option to manually deploy. We can select a specific branch, then click deploy to deploy it. Or we can choose a branch and select automatic deploy. Automatic deploy will deploy whenever a change is made to the specified branch. This can be when a change is pushed to the branch directly or when a pull request is merged. Your selected branch should always stay in a working state if you use automatic deploy. Otherwise, you could have a broken app. Heroku will automatically detect that we're deploying a Node.js app when it sees the package.json file at the root of the project. So we don't need to explicitly tell Heroku what language or runtime we're using. When it detects a Node.js project, it uses the npm start command to start the project by default. And this can be changed by using a proc file, but that's outside the scope of this video. If we click the manual deploy button, Heroku will begin deploying the app. We can see the logs as the deployment begins. Once the app is deployed, we can click view to be taken to the project URL. This URL stays the same when the app is redeployed in the future. So if we were creating a front end which makes calls to the API, we could point at this URL. There is not a page at root, but if we go to the API slash albums endpoint, we will see the album that is set by default. If we view the health check endpoint, we can see that the node EMV is set to production and there is no my setting environment variable set since we haven't set it yet. But the node EMV is there, not because we set it, but because Heroku set it. To set the environment variable, we can go to the settings page, then down to the config vars section, enter a key value pair for the name and value of the environment variable. It gets automatically deployed. Automatic deploy is pretty much the same as manual deploy, except it's automatic, obviously. It gets automatically deployed whenever there is a new commit added to the specified branch. We can go ahead and tell Heroku that we want to enable automatic deploys here. Then if we make a code change, for example, adding a version number to be returned by the health check endpoint, again, don't take this as best practice for an actual app, focus on the deployment process here. And then we commit the code, push it to the main branch on GitHub. When we hop back into Heroku and view the activity tab, we will notice that a new in-process build appears. Then once our build finishes, we can refresh our API endpoint, and we will now see the version number that we just added. 
This is the true power of continuous deployment. When we make changes and verify that they work and merge our code into the main branch, it is quickly and easily deployed and available for users to use. We don't need to find and serve for credentials, log in and pull and deploy code each time we make a change. Now that we've put in the work up front and it really wasn't that much work, future deployments are as easy as just merging the code. We have to make sure that the code we're merging into the main branch works, but we need to do that anyway. Automated tests are a great way to ensure working code, but that is outside the scope of this video. What we just looked at is probably the easiest way to deploy to Heroku using GitHub, but it is not super configurable. Deploying using GitHub Actions will give us more control over our deployment. We will only scrape the service in this video, but I will link some other resources in the video description if you would like to learn more. I'll quickly delete the Heroku app that we were just using, and then we will create a brand new Heroku app and set up the deployment pipeline using GitHub Actions. Again, we will create an app and give it a name. Then we need to get our Heroku API key, which will be how GitHub Actions will authenticate with Heroku. To do that, we'll go to Account Settings, scroll down, and then copy the API key from this section. Keep in mind that this is a secret key and should not be shared with anyone, as that would allow them to deploy new apps or change the configuration of current apps under the Heroku account. Now we can hop over to GitHub and go to the repository where our app is. Since I'm the owner of this app, I can go into the Settings page. If you would like to do this for yourself, you will need to be the owner of the repo that you would like to deploy. You can either fork this repo or create your own repo with a node app. From the settings page, we will go into secrets, then actions secrets, and we will create a new repository secret. We will call the secret Heroku API key and paste in the API key that we copied from Heroku. We could name this secret anything, but this name seems to be the standard. If you're looking at documentation or stack overflow in the future, this is likely what it will be called. We will use the secret in our actions YAML file in just a little while. Now we will configure the action itself. From the root of the app, we will create a folder called .github, then inside that folder, a folder called workflows, and inside that, create a file called main.yaml. The path to the YAML file does have to match this exactly, but it doesn't matter what we name the file itself as long as it's a YAML file. In this case, it happens to be the same name as our branch, but that doesn't need to be the case. In hindsight, it might have been nice to call this file something like deploy main to heroku.yaml or something along those lines. This YAML file is where we will configure the action. This could be referred to as infrastructure as code because the code in this workflow file determines how the app is deployed. One advantage of this is if we ever need to change the deployment, these workflow files are tracked by version control so we can track those changes. We start by giving this workflow a name. We can call it deploy. Then we need to specify when we want it to run. In this case, we want our deployment action to occur whenever there's a push to the branch called main. Unlike the file name, we do have to use the exact name of the branch here. We could also pass in a list of multiple branches. Also note that I actually made a typo when originally recording the screen, so you'll see my correction on the screen. It's supposed to be branches, not branch. Then we need to specify what the action does. This is where actions is really powerful. First, we will set it to run on Ubuntu, and then the first actual step will be to use the included checkout action so that our workflow can access our code. Then we will use the open source Heroku deploy action to deploy the app. I've included a link to this action in the video description if you would like to see what exactly it does. You can view the source code. Uh, spoiler alert, it uses the Heroku CLI. We will need to provide some configuration for the Heroku deploy action. Just like in the automatic deploy from GitHub that we did earlier, we will need to specify a branch to be deployed. We will need to specify our Heroku API key. We could directly paste it in here, but that would be really bad because this workflow configuration file is visible by others, and that would allow them to see our secret key and pretend to be us, change our configurations, create new apps, etc. So instead, we will reference the Heroku API key that we stored in the repository secrets. This will allow the action to use the secret API key, but will not expose it to other people. If we had called that secret something else, we would have to use that name here. The Heroku app name will be the exact name of the app in Heroku, which we can get from Heroku, and then we'll put our Heroku email. If we wanted to, we could also add steps to run linters to check and correct code styling, or run our unit tests, or even send a message in Slack once the deployment is complete. This is where Actions is really powerful, and I would say that this is the biggest advantage over doing the normal GitHub integration with Heroku that we looked at first. For now, we'll just focus on the deployment aspect, so we can save this file, commit it, and then push it to GitHub. In this example, we're pushing directly to main, which isn't really best practice, but the action would work the same if we were pushing up to a separate branch and then merging that in via a pull request. Once we've pushed our changes to main, we can switch to Heroku, and if we wait a few seconds, we will see that a new deployment has started. Since we were just adding the workflow YAML files, there won't be any functional change to the app, 
But if we update the version number and push again, you will notice that the version has changed from version two to version three. The same would be true if we had created a PR and merged it. Now we will actually create a new branch and make a change, update that version again, and then push up that branch. And at this point, you can see that the action is running. This is because I spelled branches wrong in the own section of the workflow file. If I had called it branches rather than the incorrect branch, then the action would only run when a change was made to the main branch. But since I spelled that wrong, changes to any branch actually cause the action to run. So don't mind me as I bumble around with this for a minute or so as I'm figuring out what I did wrong. And then when I figure out the issue and correct it and push up the commit to version four branch, we can now see that the workflow is not run since the main branch has not changed, only the version four branch changed. And then when I make a pull request and merge it, we can change over to the actions panel and see that the workflow is started. Then once the Heroku deploy step starts, we can see that the deployment is started in Heroku. And then once the deployment finishes, we can see that the version is now set to four in the actual API. Finally, as one last demo, we will view the functionality of the app in Heroku. If we make a request to the album's endpoint, we can view the album that is set when the app starts. We can also insert an album, and then view the updated list. Here we can see the request that we made to the album's git and post endpoints. If we make a request to the stop service endpoint, the service will stop. If we view the logs in Heroku, we will see that the service crashed, but has now automatically restarted. If we request the albums, we will notice that the album we previously inserted is no longer there. There's only the default album. This is because the app is now running in a completely fresh container, which means that the in-memory array of albums has been reset. If we were building an actual RESTful web API, this data would be stored in a persistent database rather than in-memory. And that is it for this video. As a quick summary, we talked about some of the features offered by Heroku and GitHub Actions, and we went over two ways to deploy a Node.js app to Heroku. One way was deploying from GitHub directly in Heroku. We looked at both manual and automatic deploys. And the second way was by using GitHub Actions, where we created a workflow.yaml file. Both options are totally valid. Deploying directly from Heroku is quick and easy to set up, but using GitHub Actions is more configurable. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider liking the video so that more people will see it. If you would like to see more videos like it in the future, consider subscribing so you'll be notified when I upload. And if you have any questions, leave them down in the comment section below. As always, thanks for watching and have a great day.